Tēnā koutou katoa. Welcome everybody. Thank you for joining us today. And for those of you who are joining us later on on YouTube, we won't be playing the audio for any of the songs that we have during our worship service today, but please, we do have links below so that you can listen online and join in, pause the video at the time and join in with a YouTube virtual worship service and thank you for again for coming to us today and we look forward to having a great service with you. As your people Father this afternoon to come before you Father before your throne of grace and mercy and just share this time together Father as your people and we pray for your guidance we pray for your blessing on everything that is said and done, Father. And um, as always, we give you all praise and thanks, Father, for your involvement in our lives, for blessing us so tremendously, Father, especially at this time, Father, when we need you. So thank you again, and we pray in us, and thank you for this opportunity at this time, in Jesus Christ's name, amen. Amen. Thank you very much, Marilyn. Um, welcome again. Um, we're worshiping on Zoom and, and YouTube, and we're glad that you've been able to log in and participate in our worship today. Um, this is almost as new for us as it is for you. Uh, while Rex and Dennis and Leanne and I have had several meetings in this format, um, it's just the second time that we've offered an opportunity to worship this way in New Zealand. Um, so it's a unique time, and we recognize that it's um, it's hard for some people to to get logged on or to connect. Um, but we're trying to make this as easy as we can. Um, so let us know if there's anything that we can do to make it easier for you to be part of the the service and the connection. Um, you can get in touch with any of us uh, by email or uh, or by mobile. Um, uh, you know, if you've got contact details for us. So just a very few announcements as we get started. Um, uh, next weekend, um, the Easter weekend, uh, there's going to be a GC Ignite um, online um, gathering, and um, uh, there's details for that on the Aussie Church website. Uh, and again, if you have trouble with that, you can uh, contact Re uh, Rex or Dennis or me and we can um, send you in the right direction for that. Uh, this Thursday, April the 9th, uh, we're going to have an online Lord's Supper service. That's going to start at 7.30 p.m. And we'll make sure that, again, if you've been able to log on with Zoom, um, that you get uh, the meeting uh, invite um, uh, information and, and password for that. Uh, and if you're planning to be part of that online Lord's Supper service, um, you'll need to prepare a small amount of bread uh, and wine to use for the observance that evening. Uh, I want to thank Rex for having distributed already a one-page direction uh, one page uh, summary of directions for observing uh, the Lord's Supper individually if you're unable to participate on online or over the phone. Um, and uh, you'll know that Rex is also distributing, uh, as he has been always, the regular New Zealand updates by email each week. They come either Thursday or Friday. Um, and uh, next week at this time, uh, we'll be having uh, our next, uh, well, it won't be the next service because we're doing the, the Lord's Supper on Thursday evening, but the next weekend service will be uh, uh, an observance of, um, of the resurrection uh, Sunday, 12th April at 2 p.m. again on Zoom. And we'll make sure, as I said before, that you get log on information for that as well. Um, those were the most important announcements that I had. Um, uh, Rex and Dennis, can you sort of uh, chime in if there's anything important that I've forgotten at the moment? Uh, 
Oh, I could mention one quick announcement regarding a cyclone bearing down on Vanuatu at this very moment. Uh, sounds like a Category 5 cyclone is going to strike Vanuatu. Wow. Uh, so that's something that we could be praying about at this point. Yeah. All right. Add that to your personal list, my goodness. Dennis found uh, a really interesting uh, piece that we decided to include in this service, a sonnet for Palm Sunday. Uh, as you know, today is traditionally known as Palm Sunday, remembering Jesus' triumphant entrance into Jerusalem. This poem explores the idea that what was happening out there and back then as Christ entered the holy city is also happening in here and right now. Um, there is a Jerusalem of the heart, if you like. Uh, our inner life also has its temple and palaces, its places of corruption, its gardens of rest and its seat of judgment, and all of these uh, things are a part of this sonnet. Uh, so here is how uh, one author has thought about today and what it means for us. A Sonnet for Palm Sunday. Now to the gate of my Jerusalem, the seething holy city of my heart, the Savior comes. But will I welcome him? O oh, crowds of easy feelings make a start. They raise their hands, get caught up in the singing, and think the battle won. Too soon they'll find the challenge the reversal he is bringing, changes their tune. I know what lies behind the surface flourish that so quickly fades, self-interest and fearful guardedness, the hardness of the heart, its barricades, and at the core, the dreadful emptiness of a perverted temple. Jesus come, Break my resistance and make me your home. You are everybody. Good to see you. Um, I'm going to be reading in a moment from uh, Isaiah 50, verses 4 to 9. But before that, I thought I'd just say a few words. Um, firstly, to acknowledge that uh, this passage in Isaiah 50, apart from probably being a good favourite with many of us, uh, is wonderfully appropriate, I feel, at this time, both in sense of how we are beginning to do life in new ways, and also in the sense of the celebration of Christ's final week as he approached Jerusalem and then his betrayal and uh, trial and crucifixion. Uh, this passage kind of set up for people at crossroads going in significant directions. Now, traditionally, the church has always known and always believed and thought that this passage was speaking directly to Christ's experience especially as he was heading into Jerusalem for that final time, as his whole ministry crescendoed to its great climax in his death and resurrection. And that, of course, will be our focus next weekend. But this message, I think, is also relevant today, because today we wrestle with working through the challenges and the opportunities, possibilities of our lockdown world, new ways of connecting, helping neighbours, friends, it is a new world, and as we uh, sort of step forward into this, uh, I think these words are encouraging as well. Now, why this passage appeals at this moment uh, is because it tells us very plainly that God has got our back. No matter what the difficulty is that we go through, he's there for us. And as Eugene Peterson puts it, he has prepared us and the way ahead of us 
so that we know how to encourage tired people. And then he faithfully and daily speaks to each of us as one ready to take orders. The, the point being, of course, that we encourage the hurting and reassure those who are having a hard time. Now, if, as we read the passage, you will note that four times it mentions the sovereign Lord did something or does something. In verse 4, he equips and empowers us. He lifts us up and fills us up. In verse 5, it says that he opens our ears and points us to the work we're to do. And then in verses 7 and 9, he helps us. You go back to the, the first half, the first two, they're in past tense. So these are things that God has already done. He's already filled us. He's already prepared for us. And he's already spoken to us so that we know where we're going. But the last two are his, they're in present tense. And they're telling us what he is doing for us. And in the end, it's also telling us the accumulated testimony of his working in our lives that we have as a result of all of this. And so you'll hear all of these things happening as we go through these few verses. But of course, in the middle of it is that little bit that I think we remember the most. And that's the bit that says, it's not going to be easy. It takes grit and determination. He may have our back, but it's not going to be a cakewalk. And as Peterson also says it, he puts it this way, we need to set our face like flint, confident that we will never regret this. And so it points to faith being elemental and central in all of what's going on. So this passage, I feel, is aimed at the church as we face the challenges we have in front of us. And even though they seem great, he is there with us and has readied us for us and is speaking to us and is going to make our words as they go out return to us eventually, not empty, but having achieved something according to what his will is. So I'll read now the passage, Isaiah chapter 50, 4 down to 9a. The sovereign Lord has given me a well-instructed tongue to know the word that sustains the weary. He wakens me morning by morning, wakens my ear to listen like one being instructed. The sovereign Lord has opened my ears. I have not been rebellious. I have not turned away. I offered my back to those who beat me, my cheeks to those who pulled out my beard. I did not hide my face from mocking and spitting. Because the sovereign Lord helps me, I will not be disgraced. Therefore, I have set my face like flint, and I know I will not be put to shame. He who vindicates me is near. Who then will bring charges against me? Let us face each other. Who is my accuser? Let him confront me. It is the sovereign Lord who helps me. Who will condemn me? They will all wear out like a garment. The moths will eat them up. So those words I feel really are aimed towards us to encourage us, to strengthen us for the path ahead and to remind us that we are both in God's will, doing God's will, and uh, that he has us safely in his hands and prepared us for the work that we're about to do. Okay, my scripture reading is Philippians 2 verses 5 to 11. Uh, at this time that we are in, when we are looking forward to the coming uh, weekend, in Philippians 2, it talks about Christ's humility. And in verses 5, here it talks about our relationships with one another. So from Philippians 2 verse 5, in your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. 
Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness and being found in appearance as a man. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Verse 9, Therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under, this, and under the earth, and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Good afternoon, everybody. I hope um, you're all doing okay in this time of this extraordinary time of global lockdown. It's great to be able to have the opportunity to talk to you all in this way, and I hope you're all hearing me loud and clear. Apologies to those in Auckland who might find this sermon reminds you of one I gave recently, but today's lectionary sermon is entitled Jesus, Friend of Losers. And it comes from Matthew chapters 26 and 27. You might like to have your Bible open to those passages as we go through it. As we read in these chapters of Jesus' last meal and his betrayal, his arrest and crucifixion, in Matthew 26 and 27 here, we see someone who experiences one of the most undesirable and painful feelings of being a human. The feeling of, of, being, of losing being betrayed by his closest friends, yelling prayers into an empty night, mocked and derided by crowds of people, crying out in agony on a cross. And just at the time, his disciples were looking for a great show of military power, kicking Rome out of Israel at last, but it didn't work out that way. To all intents and purposes, Jesus looked like a sad and tragic failure at that time. Let's start in Matthew 26, uh, verse 14. One of the twelve, the one called Judas Iscariot, went to the chief priests and asked, What are you willing to give me if I deliver him over to you? So they counted out for him 30 pieces of silver. And from then on, Judas watched for the opportunity to hand Jesus over. This was the price, 30 pieces of silver, uh, paid the price paid for a slave in um, Exodus 21:32. So it shows how much he was worth to Judas and those who bought him. And it gives extra force to the words of Jesus that he came as a slave, as he came to serve as a servant or a slave in Matthew 20, verse 28. It wasn't very much money to betray his master to death. Well, coming down to, to verse 20, so when evening came, verse 20, here in Matthew 26, Jesus was reclining at the table with the twelve, and while they were eating, he said, Truly I tell you, one of you will betray me. And they were very sad, and began to say to him, one after the other, Surely you don't mean me, Lord. It was sad for the disciples that this was going to happen. Imagine how sad it was for Jesus that one of the disciples that he'd spent so much time with and taught so carefully and shown his way of life and his sterling example to, uh, he was going to throw it all back in Jesus' face. And coming down to the next verse, in verse 23, Jesus replied, The one who has dipped his hand into the bowl with me will betray me. The Son of Man will go just as it is written about him. Then Judas, uh, the one who was going to betray him, said, Surely you don't mean me, Rabbi. Jesus answered, You have said so. Judas had gone about this with complete secrecy. He had hidden his plans from his fellow disciples. They didn't know about it at all. Uh, but of course, he couldn't hide it from Jesus Christ, who sees the secrets of all of our hearts. We can't conceal anything from him. And he, he could have used his power at that time to blast Judas, to paralyze him, to make him sick, even to kill him. But the only weapon that 
Jesus used was that of the appeal of love, loving Judas right to the end, loving him so that he hopefully could see that it was wrong what he was doing. And in the same way, God doesn't force us and coerce us to stop us from sinning. What he does really is to appeal to us to do better and leaves it up to us to make the choice. He works with our conscience to help us to see what we're going to do is wrong. But sometimes, all too often, we go ahead deliberately and sin anyway. And that's a very sad failure of human nature. The next couple of verses we'll read, uh, no doubt, at the uh, Lord's Supper service. And as we come down now to verse 31, notice what it says here. Then Jesus told them, this very night you will all fall away on account of me. Every one of you will fall away. For it's written, I'll strike the shepherd and the sheep of the flock will be scattered. It's pretty sad, isn't it, that every single one of the students that he had spent, all his ministry there, the three and a half years teaching, and each one of them was going to fall away. It really looked uh, very much as if Jesus was a loser, a friend of losers, as our sermon subject puts it. He had invested all of his energy in choosing uh, and working with a bunch of people that turned out to be losers. Down in verse 33, Peter replied, Even if all fall away on account of you, I never will. Truly I tell you, Jesus answered, this very night before the rooster crows, you will disown me three times. But Peter declared, even if I have to die with you, I will never disown you. And all the other disciples said the same. It wasn't only Peter. Every one of the disciples said that they would stick with Jesus. Peter was convinced of his own faith and his strength, but he was totally wrong. He couldn't see his faults and his weaknesses, but Jesus certainly could. Jesus knows us better than we know ourselves. It's good for us to ask the question, would I betray him? Would I stick up for him right till the end, no matter what the pressure, if I had to die for my beliefs? But isn't it true that we all betray him every time we sin? We go against what he wants us to do? Let's not be too overconfident of our own righteousness. Uh, it says, of course, in 1 Corinthians 10, verse 12, So if you think you are standing firm, be careful that you don't fall. Let him who thinks he stands beware, lest he fall. And uh, that's why it's good to, for us to examine ourselves uh, prior to the Lord's Supper time to remind us how much we do need. Each and every one of us personally needs the sacrifice of Jesus to cover our sins. In verse, six, uh, verse 36 of Matthew 26, Then Jesus went with his disciples to a place called Gethsemane, and he said to them, Sit here while I go over there and pray. He took Peter and the two sons of Zebedee along with him, and he began to be sorrowful and troubled. And he said to them, My soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. Stay here and keep watch with me. When you think about it, what Jesus was saying there, asking his disciples was pretty humbling. He, he was admitting that he was fearful. He said, I, my soul's overwhelmed with sorrow. He was overwhelmed so that he didn't want to be alone at that time. Don't leave me, he was saying. Just, just stay here with me just a little while and give me some support. I don't want to be here on my own. He didn't ask for much but they failed him again. And when we're going through times of loneliness and sadness and trouble and despair, we can know that Jesus understands that because he has been there. And when no one comes to our aid, no one else understands, sometimes we feel, well, Jesus has been there too. We're never alone. Jesus is always with us. Even when we walk through the valley of the shadow of death. Uh, God is with us. The Lord is with us. His rod and his staff, they comfort us. 
Of course, in the next few verses, we see that that happened three times, that the disciples failed to come and support their master. And coming down to verse 45, Jesus returned to the disciples and said to them, are you still sleeping and resting? How disappointing for him to realize that there was no way that they were going to lend a hand to support him. They were just a bunch of losers, you might say. The next uh, few verses go through that betrayal kiss. When Jesus came with the crowd armed with swords and clubs, and we come down to verse 51. With that, one of Jesus' companions reached for his sword and drew it out and struck the servant of the high priest, cutting off his ear. Verse 52, put your sword back in its place, Jesus said to him, for all who draw the sword will die by the sword. I guess that by the world standards, that makes Jesus a loser. He didn't stand up and fight. In our world, the winner is the most powerful the most fearless, the one who beats up his enemies. But Jesus is, of course, the opposite, and he stopped the cycle of violence. And we see in the next verse, verse 53, that, of course, Jesus realized that in no way was he a loser. In verse 53, he said, Don't you think that I can't call on my Father, and he will at once put at my disposal more than 12 legions of angels? Uh, he had that power to call on, but he didn't do that, even though it was at his disposal. Because, as it says in verse 54, how then would the scriptures be fulfilled that say it must happen in this way? So Jesus' death was by his own choice. He could have slipped away now at this point and saved himself, but he chose to lay down his life for our salvation. And when we come to towards the end of verse 56, then all the disciples deserted him and fled. He was most certainly the friend of losers at this point in time. All through his ministry, actually, he did his best to work with losers, with prostitutes, with terrorists, tax collectors. He touched the lepers. He defended adulterers caught in the act. In fact, when you look at it, throughout history, God has defended what you might say are the losers of the world, the poor, the widows, the fatherless, the strangers. God always looks out for them. And that is the record of, of, of uh, Scripture and of God's working with mankind. Verses 69 to 75 show how much of a loser Peter was denying his master three times after being warned that he would do so, lying about his connection with Jesus through cowardice and weakness, even swearing and cursing about it. You see there in those verses, verse 72, he denied it again with an oath. I don't know the man. Verse 74, he called down curses. He swore to them, I don't know the man. And this shows the staggering honesty of the New Testament. If ever there was an incident, incident uh, which one might have expected to be hushed up, you know, if these people were writing this story, most people write in a way that tries to make themselves look um, good. Well, um, this one wasn't hushed up. Peter didn't use his authority to hush up these things. In fact, he let them out there for, for all. All the sad and disappointing detail of the weakness of Peter comes out here, uh, pretty well shows uh, that it wasn't something that was just a made-up story. And we go on now into chapter 27 and see that in this chapter, the, the, the weakness of Jesus, that humanly speaking, by man's way of looking at it, he was an utter failure. It comes out strongly in chapter 27. Dropping down to verse 27. Matthew 27, 27. The governor's soldiers took Jesus into the praetorium and gathered the whole company of soldiers around him. They stripped him and put a scarlet robe on him. 
and then twisted together a crown of thorns and set it on his head. They put a staff in his right hand. Then they knelt in front of him and mocked him. Hail, King of the Jews, they said. They spit on him. They took the staff and struck him on the head again and again. After they'd mocked him, they took off the robe and put his own clothes on him. Then they led him away to crucify him. It was a tragic time. And uh, Jesus was terribly treated and just uh, rejected and beaten and despised. And in verse 39, those who passed by hurled insults at him, shaking their heads and saying, you are going to destroy the temple and build it in three days. Save yourself. Come down from the cross if you're the son of God. Just mocking him and ridiculing him, sarcastically scoffing at him. In the same way, the chief priests, the teachers of the law, the elders, they were all there gathered around and they were all mocking him and ridiculing him. He saved others, I said, but he can't save himself. Look how hopeless and useless he is. He's the king of Israel, or so he says. Let him come down now from the cross and we'll believe in him. He trusts in God. Let God rescue him now if he wants him. For he said, I'm the son of God. So, of course, Jesus had the power to do that. He could have done that. But then the plan would have been disrupted. So he had to lie there or stand there or stay there on the cross uh, in the midst of all of this uh, dis distressing uh, conduct of those around him. In the same way, the rebels who were crucified with him, also they heaped insults on him. The insults that were hurled at Jesus, they labelled him as a loser, unable to save himself, totally weak and useless. Notice the way it puts it in um, Psalm 22. Psalm 22, verse 6, verses 6 to 8. Actually a prophecy uh, of Jesus Christ. And the way that it's put there but I am a worm and not a man, scorned by everyone, despised by the people. All who see me mock me. They hurl insults, shaking their heads. He trusts in the Lord, they say. Let the Lord rescue him. Let him deliver him since he delights in him. An amazingly accurate prophecy given years and years, hundreds, thousand years before Christ's uh, crucifixion. You notice it, it, he's called a worm. I'm a worm and not a man. How low can you go, you know, in, in um, being put down and humiliated? And uh, the final humiliation really is in back in Matthew 27, looking at verse 46. About three in the afternoon, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Eli, Eli, lemma sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He expressed here the most desperate human feeling that we can have, the lowest that, that Jesus could come to, the lowest feeling that we can have as a human of actually being abandoned by God. This, this plumbs the very depths of the human experience where Jesus absolutely felt abandoned and forsaken by God so that however bad and forsaken we ever feel, uh, Jesus has been there. Jesus understands. Jesus was in that situation too. That can be comforting to us. It says in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 2, Fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith, for the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. So the cross was shameful, and another version puts it, he accepted the shame of the cross as if it were nothing. Shame is a feeling of disgrace, embarrassment, humiliation. It's one of the most miserable feelings that we as human can go through. We certainly don't want other people to hear about our times of shame. We, I'm sure, can all think of something that we've done or many things we've done. Imagine having that brought up in front of others so everyone 
can be around and looking at you and seeing this incident from your life, the things that you have done, the way that your mind has thought at times. Uh, shame is something that we don't want to go through, but Jesus went through it. And Max Lucado, a Christian writer, wrote about this, uh, just quoting from something he wrote. This is exactly what Jesus felt. Why, you ask? He never did anything worthy of shame. No, but we did. And since on the cross, uh, God made him become sin, Jesus was covered with shame. Of course, it says in um, 2 Corinthians 5.21, God made him who had no sin to be sin for us. So Jesus became sin for us. Our sins were heaped on him. All of our sins were put onto him so that he actually became that. He was covered with shame. He was shamed before his family, physically as well. He was stripped naked before his own mother and loved ones, shamed before his fellow men, forced to carry a cross until the weight caused him to stumble, shamed before his church. The pastors and elders of his day mocked him, calling him names. He was shamed before the city of Jerusalem, condemned to, cry, to die a criminal's death. Parents lightly pointed to him from a distance and told their children, that's what they do to evil men. And continuing to quote here from Max Lucado, but the shame before men didn't compare with the shame Jesus felt before his father. Our individual shame seems too much to bear. Can you imagine bearing the collective shame of all humanity? One wave of shame after another was dumped on Jesus. Though he never cheated, he was convicted as a cheat. Though he never stole, he was regarded as a thief. Though he never lied, he was considered a liar. Though he never lusted, he bore the shame of an adulterer. And not only was he shamed, uh, that ends the quote from Max Lucado, um, but uh, just to go on beyond that, he was even more than just shamed. It says in Galatians 3.13 that Jesus was cursed. Galatians 3.13, Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it's written, cursed is everyone who's hung on a pole. Someone who's hung on a stake is cursed, and he became a curse for us. So he carried that awful shame, that total forsakenness. He was labeled a hopeless loser, all because of us, all to help us, so that we can be saved from our sins. These are some of the things that we can consider carefully as we prepare just in the next few days for the commemoration of the crucifixion at the Lord's Supper observance, which is coming up. So Jesus can be described as being the friend of losers when he walked the earth. He's always been a friend of losers, actually. One who friends, befriends the weak, the poor, the orphans, and the fatherless. And he's still a friend of losers today because we are losers and he's our friend. But with Jesus as our friend, losers become winners. Because, of course, Jesus isn't really a loser, but in fact the direct opposite. He's now back on his glorious throne in heaven where he can rule over the universe in power and majesty. And he invites us to join him there. With Jesus as our friend, losers become winners. Winners of salvation, thanks to the glorious sacrifice that Jesus made for us. And, and we're going to, because of that, inherit the glorious life of the kingdom of God for all eternity. So uh, I've uh, selected Gail to, to give the closing prayer, if possible. Are you there, Gail? Yes, I'm here. Yes. Let us pray. 
Our loving Heavenly Father, we just thank you for this opportunity of being able to come together, Lord, through this Zoom media avenue. We just thank you, Lord, for Leanne and all the work that she's done to get it up and running. Loving Heavenly Father, we just pray that you will be with each and every one of us during this time of lockdown. That, Lord, you will give us this time to just look at ourselves, to examine ourselves more fully, more deeply, because your love does demand our life, our all. And loving Heavenly Father, I just pray that you will give us this time to more deeply reflect on what your sacrifice really means for each and every one of us. Because loving Heavenly Father, our life depends on you. You are the way, the truth, and the life. And we just thank you for your incredible sacrifice. But we thank you for the life that you have given us through your death, through your resurrection and ascension. And loving Heavenly Father, I just pray that you will help us all to use this season for greater reflection on who you are and what you mean in our daily lives. And help us, Lord, during this time of lockdown, to reach out to those that need reaching out to, and to pray for those that need praying for. And loving Father, I just ask you to bless each and every one of us. Be with us, strengthen us, Lord, and keep us close to you. We thank you, Lord Jesus, for this and ask these things in and through your precious name. Amen. Amen. So listen to these words from Paul's letter to the Romans. May the God who gives endurance and encouragement give us the same attitude of mind towards each other that Christ Jesus had, so that with one mind and one voice we may glorify the Lord and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Let us accept one another then, as Christ accepted us, in order to bring praise to God. And now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen. Amen.